and today I'm actually going to train on access controls and documentation that goes with it. So before we start, I want to say uh, I want to say uh, that you guys should take care of yourselves. I know that we're having all this stuff happening right now with the uh, the pandemic that's going all all around the world. Just make sure you're uh, washing your hands, like try to isolate your try to quarantine yourself for the sake of really it's for the sake of the 20 percent of the population who's really going to be affected by it not necessarily that they're going to die or anything but people who are more susceptible to uh to the symptoms of covid19 so just think about think about them like me myself i'm not i you know i'm i'm not prone to sickness i'm not you know, even though I'm in my 40s, I'm, I'm very healthy. I don't have a lot to worry about. But my mom, you know, she's in her 60s. And she might be susceptible to it. Uh, people with um, with weak immune systems, they're going to be susceptible to it. So just for their sake, like, quarantine yourself. Think about them. So just I hope everybody out there is taking care of yourself, taking care of your family, and doing what you, what you know is right. All right, let's get started. So... We're going to be talking about something a little bit different. Normally what I do is I go through jobs, break all of those jobs down, and then talk about like how to get the jobs, and, and then I break down what the employer wants to see. But today we're going to do some actual training. Now if you're interested in this training, if you want to go deeper, if you want to deep dive, because I'm only going to cover like a few security controls, but if you want to deep dive, if you really want to know this stuff, then I have a couple of courses for you. I've got a risk management information system security officer foundations course if you want to actually know it from scratch. Like you, you're an IT person. You, this is not for an entry level type person. The risk management framework foundations is going to assume that you have some level of IT uh, background. And from there, I build on what you already know. It, and it walks you through how to get into risk management framework how to do the actual information system security officer work. So if you want to deep dive into this, go to combocourses.com and go check those courses out. I also have this, what you're about to see as one slice of some of the stuff that I'm putting into a new course that I'm developing right now. And if you want to have a full blown, you want to really check it out. I've got a free, the first port portion of the course is actually free right now. If you go to combocourses.com, you sign in, and you can actually see um, the context of what I'm talking about, and there's a lot of really good stuff. But right now, let's get into access controls and some of the documentation. Um, let me see here. All right, so here are the access controls. These are actually these are all the security controls. And why you're seeing two sets of these is that one is from Risk Management Framework. 37 version 1 and one the bottom one is from version 2 that's coming that's already out right now but uh, there's a set of uh, NIST 853 controls that are coming soon and so that's what you're seeing right now on the screen so the top one is from version 4 ver version is it version 3 or version 4 <laughs> The, the top one you're seeing is from the current version of the 800 NIST 853 controls. The bottom one is the one that's in draft right now, but it should be out. I think this year is when they, they recently pushed it out to some other date. So anyway, so those are that's what you're seeing. You're seeing access controls. You're seeing um, AT controls, training controls, MP controls, media protection, physical controls, all these different controls, right? that I'm gonna cover all of these in the training, right? I'm gonna be releasing them month over month until we get all the way to the end. And then I'll also ask questions if you if you purchase the, the actual uh, course. But right now we're gonna focus on just AC controls and just a few of those AC controls, by the way. Um, if it would take us, it's gonna be many, many lessons to actually break down all that just AC controls, there's 25 of them right now as of the time of this recording all right so first of all what are access controls so access controls are what an organization uses to control physical not it's just not it's not just 
uh, logical con uh, controls, not just access to the information, but it also includes access to the system itself. So some of that is in there, but it also includes things like roles. My cat's in here. This is this is live, by the way. So <laughs> uh, this is gonna can include things like um, role-based uh, uh, privileges. It's gonna include things like um, separation of duties. There's a lot of different things, but let's talk about access. What is access? It's the ability to make use of any system or resource. So somebody walks into your facility and they want access to uh, your servers, right? They need access. So access control is the process of granting or denying specific requests and obtaining uh obtaining access <laughs> access uh, obtaining access to that information is what we're talking about here and so the nist 800 controls actually con it goes through a breakdown of how an organization goes about managing access to the information all right so these top six controls are some of the most important ones and i'll talk about this in greater detail in the in the course in the in the uh, part of the free course I talk a little bit about it but I go in more depth in the in the one that's coming out I'm gonna try to release it this month but I talk about AC1 AC2 and now we're gonna right now we're gonna talk about AC3 AC3 access control 3 is access enforcement so what is access enforcement it is the organization's uh, ability to implement the actual access control policies. So not only does your organization have to put a policy in place that talks about how to control access, AC3 says not you have to implement it. How, how they implemented this, uh, the actual access uh, to the information. Like you're saying in this document that you have access controls and you're saying that a person has to be trained before they come in. You're saying, now do you do it? Do, or is it implemented throughout your organization? All right. So that's what we're going to talk about. All right. Let me show you what I'm talking about. And you can follow along. Feel free to follow along with me if you like. What I'm doing is I am on NIST. Let me see if I can give you this link here if you want to follow along. Nope, I can't sign into the chat. But where I'm at is it's NIST dot uh, it's nvd.nist.gov if you want to follow along with me. That's where I'm at right now. You go to Google and type in nvd.nist.gov, you'll find it. And if you go to once you get there, you'll click you'll click on the families like this. Let me just show you real quick. Click on the families. This site has all the families, breaks each one down, as you can see here. And then I went to access controls, and you got access control one, two, and now we're on three. So I'm clicking on three right here. If you wanna, if you wanna follow along, you can also just download the PDF, the NIST 853 PD, PDS, uh, PDF, and then look at 853. AC3 and you'll find everything we're seeing right here. So what are we talking about here? This right here breaks down what AC3 is. Access enforcement. All right. So let's just look at the actual description here. Let me just make this a little bit bigger so we can read this together and then we're going to interpret it. The information system enforces approved authori authorization for logical access to information and, inf and system resources in accordance with the applicable access control policy. All right, so let's break this down. So the information system enforces, information system, what is an information system? It's a computer, it's a server, it's a workstation, it's a, it's a Cisco device, it's an internet working device, it's a firewall, Information system covers all like that ground. It's a very general term, but it, we're, we're saying here the AC3 says it enforces whatever system that is. Let's say it's a 
Windows 6 2016 server. It enforces approved authorizations for logical access to the information system. So in other words, there's logical, what do we mean by logical? So there's technical things in place on the system that enforce what you have written in your security policy. That is what they're saying here. So logical access, I'll give you a specific example on our on our example of a, of a server, 2016 Windows Server, right? So a logical access would be, or enforcement of that logical access would be username and password, simple enough. So if you written, if you if your organization wrote in your policy that everyone who comes in has to have a username and the username has to be 20 characters <laughs> the username has to fit a certain uh certain policy and then the password has to fit a certain policy password has to be 14 characters long has to use upper or lower case all that stuff's in your your policy right they're saying that you have to have implemented that into the actual server itself. And so, um, and before I show you how you as an information system security officer can actually check this out and make sure that the organization is doing it, let's just deep dive into this a little bit further. All right, so in here it's, it's finishing out the sentence. It says, the information and system resource in, uh, in the in accordance with applicable access control policies. Yeah, there's, so there you go. The organization writes the policy and then the system has to actually implement what you said in the policy. That's what it's saying right here. That's really the name of the game here. Uh, so as an information system security officer, I've been doing this for a long time and the name of the game is the organization creates a policy, right? The policy states what the rules are to having access to your environment and then you're making sure as the information system security officer you're making sure that all of those all of those policies are documented and they're that they're in place and if they're not in place you have to work it out with the stakeholders and one of the things that you can do is a plan of action and milestone but that's that's for a whole another discussion okay so let's this is like look at a little bit more of this so we can get more details supplemental guide so this is a great supplemental guides are great because they put it in plain english what they're saying here so once again, if you're, if you're joining this late, this is AC3, and I'm talking about we're interpreting it, and then we're talking about how to implement this as an information system security officer. All right, so let's get back into this. The supplemental guide says, access control policies. And uh, it says, identified identify based policies, role-based policy, control matrix, Cryptography. So these are some of the things you might put in your security control, uh, in your in your access control policy or your, your overall security policy. That's just why they're examples. They're just giving you some examples. So control access between activities, entities, or subjects. So they're talking about. Here are some examples. You might have cryptography. That cryptography cryptography might be between. Um, might be between the user object and a, a file, right? So they're, they're trying to be, the way they write these is try to be as general as possible so that the organization has the, has the freedom to implement the level of security that they need for their environment because there's many kinds of environments. That's why they write these like this. All right, so and they said, okay, give you an example of, of different kinds of entities, active entities and subjects, users, uh, or processes acting on behalf of users. Passive entities or objects, see just what I just said. So they're saying that the access control policy will have some sort of a role base or a cryptography or something between different objects within the environment. That's what they're saying here in this guidance. But let me show you, let's put this in action. Let's put this in action. Let me see, what can we do here? Okay, where I'm at right now is what's called AC, um, we're on AC3, but I'm on a document called 800-53A. Here's how you can determine whether or not your organization is actually, is actually implementing the
the AC3 in uh, access enforcement. You go to, this is just one of the things you can do, by the way, one of the, one of the main things that I do. You go to 853A, and 853A is how you assess each one of the controls, all the controls. It has, has every single one of the controls. So 853A, the reason why it's so useful is because when it's whenever a system is assessed, this document is what they actually use, or some parts of this document is what they might use. And they, the assessor might even not even know that they're using 853A, but all the assessment stuff comes from this source document. So it's very useful. Okay, so first of all, assessment objectives for AC3. Determine if the information system enforces approved authorizations for logical access. This is what we just read, right? So the assessor has to make sure that number one, you have a security policy, right? Or some kind of some kind of a policy, and that a policy addresses access controls. Now the assessor, one of their objectives is to make sure that the logical the technical uh, security features that you put on your system are in place and they match what you what was written by and approved by your organization in the security policy. That's all they're doing. They're saying, okay, what do you have in your security policy? All right, are you doing that on this on this Windows 16, 2016 server? Let's see. That's what they'll do. They'll just say, okay, log into the system. You'll log into the system and it meets that just you logging in meets one of the um, access controls because one of the access controls is that everybody will have a role a role everybody will have a username password everyone will have a role and then what they might do is say okay log in uh, let me see you log in with a normal user account and then they'll say okay now try to access this uh, this file system that that you're not supposed to access they'll they'll tell you to access like say the audit logs or something a normal user shouldn't be able to access the audit logs so that's the kind of things that they do now let, let me show you something else potential assessment methods and objectives so this is things that a an assessor can use to assess whether or not you have implemented ac3 you can either examine you can interview or you can test, right? So normally for AC3, from what I've seen, they do two things. They look at your uh, your access control policy, which is normally in your security policy, and then they see they say, okay, let me see what you got. Let me let me see you do it. Let me see you access that system. Let me see you access the backup drives, and then they're determining whether or not you can. So that's one of the things that they do now. Let's go to another control here. Let's go to the next control. And I'm going to go through a few controls here for you guys. Let's go to AC4. And this is information flow enforcement. We're going to talk very briefly about this one. We won't spend a lot of time on it. But it is important, just so you know. What is AC4? information flow enforcement is the organization controlling the flow of data and is it documented as an information system security officer those are the main questions for ac4 so let's go ahead and let me show you what we're talking about here we're going to go to ac4 and i'm still on nvd.nist.gov and i just want to if you're joining me late you can just you can follow along if you want but I'm on nvd.nist.gov 800-53. Here we are. We're going to interpret it, and then I'm going to show you how it's implemented, how some of the things that you can do to actually check on it. So AC controls, let's see. Let's just kind of go right to the description here. Here we are, and it says, the information system, we already described what an information system is, enforces approved authorizations for controlling the flow of information within the system and between interconnected systems based on what the organization says right they don't the nist doesn't tell you tell the organization what those control policies what you should what elements should be controlled they allow the organization to control and that's why they say um, interconnection systems based on organization defined 
flow information flow policy. So the organization defines what the flow, the information flow is, and then you're supposed the information the organization has to enforce those policies that they put forth. So one of the main things that I have seen done to document information flow enforcement is a diagram. So a diagram that kind of maybe like looks like this. It has firewalls. Let's kind of go through this. This is on the NIST. Uh, this is on um, Cisco.com, by the way. Network diagram. It has a DMZ. It has three servers in the DMZ, right? And we can see our DMZ is connected to a switch. The switch is uh, connecting two different networks. Those networks are protected by these two different firewalls. Here's one LAN but that's behind a firewall. And it has some VPNs that are connected to the internet, right? So this one has more exposure than these ones over here. This is the inside of our of our organization. So this one's behind an internal firewall. So this is an external firewall, and this is an internal firewall. And so this right here is showing what kind of flow enforcement we have. So we're just saying that our data just doesn't go out everywhere. It's controlled. We have a we have a inner protected sanctum here with LAN computers with all of our protected data on it, and then we have outside systems. Uh, we have a we have a protection from the internet. So this is actually the internet. Maybe we have VPN clients that log in or guest accounts that can log in to certain limited resources that we have out there, but. What we're saying with flow control is that we're, our data is not going anywhere. Now, I've, I've seen this done and documented different ways. Another way that I've documented in the past, or I've seen other organizations document it, is to just have a list of all of the land. If you have um, land in building five, a land in building seven, and a land in building 10, you would just list out, here's the lands, and here's what they connect to. You could have like in a spreadsheet and explain what's going on with those things. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and um, move on from this one, and I'm going to address a couple of more access controls real quick. We're gonna go straight into these two right here. We're gonna talk about AC5 separation of duties and AC6 privileged, uh, least privileged. These ones right here are, um, Probably the most overlooked security controls in the AC control family. And the reason I say that is because a lot of organizations I go to, one of the main vulnerabilities that they have is they either give too many permissions to users that don't need it, or they don't separate they don't separate the different organization organizational duties. And it's it's an easy one to do, especially if you're in a smaller if you're in a smaller organization where you don't you only have like 10 users a lot of times those 10 users will have 10 different hats you know what i mean is your security guy will do all the administrator administrator work and they'll do all the system analyst work and then they'll also be making multi-million dollar choices for the whole organization that they don't that's not separation of duties um and sometimes you don't really need you know, multiple people because you have five computers, right? Five assets, and you don't really need a bunch of people to do uh, all these different jobs. Um, so this is this one. These two right here are foundational. Like you, you really, the organization really needs to have these, but I notice a lot of people don't don't have them. Let's kind of dive into what these actually mean because I, I realize I'm probably. Uh, talking about stuff that you don't you might not understand so let's go back here I'm on nvd.nist.gov once again and I'm going to go to families just to show you how I got here and I'm gonna to go to AC controls and then I'm gonna to go to I'm gonna to go to separation of duties I just want to explain what separation of duties is and then we'll go to AC6 least privilege all right here we are right here and I see some people joining me. Um, thanks for watching. I'll be answering questions after I cover these two items right here. All right, AC5 separation of duties. What is separation of duties? What do you do with the separation of duties? The organization, this is NIST 853. The organization, whatever organization you work for, 
this is what they will do. The organization separates organization-defined duties of individuals. What does this mean? Let me interpret it for you. All right. So it says the organization, if it's the Department of Health and Human Services, if it's the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Labor in, in Maine, whatever organization it is, um, the organization, let's say the Department of Health and Human Services, separates um, whatever, or whatever duties that they, that they define. So the organization has to actually define different duties and then they separate the duties. So the NIST is not telling you, yea, verily, all cybersecurity people can't do any kind of administrator work or administrator work can't do firewall work or a server guy can't be a, also be a firewall guy. That's not what they're saying. They're saying that where it makes sense, you're going to separate duties apart. So if you have... And what you're trying to avoid is is conflict of interest. That's what the reason why you're trying to do it, right? So, and there's certain places where it makes sense. If you're in a very small organization, you don't really have to necessarily, if you don't have the resources to do it, or if there's no reason to do it, if you don't have a server that's controlling a thousand different systems or a hundred different systems, you probably don't really need separation to do these. You can have your ISO, your information system security guy, also do some, uh, so the firewall and also look at logs, you know, and there's no conflict of interest. But if you have a whole bunch of computer systems and you, you, you can't not even possibly track all the users on a day to day basis uh, and there's data, there's thousands of terabytes of data coming in and out of your network. Yes, you probably want to think about separation of duties. You probably want to have a whole security unit. That, all, that also watches the administrators and a separate administrator account um, that is controlled by a whole other office. All right, let's keep, keep reading this and kind of get an idea of what's going on. You have to document the separation of duties of these individuals that the organization has, has deemed necessary to have. Right, so if you have a firewall team and you have a server team, you have to document that these are the individuals who control this and these are the roles that control these items here. Define information system access authorizations to support separation of duties. So you're gonna define what level of access these people have and then what systems that they have access to. So that's what, in a nutshell, that's what you're doing. That's what separation of duties is. And like I said, I do see this one violated quite a bit. It's a kind of fine, it's a foundational um, best practice that you do in, in larger organizations, especially or medium sized organizations. Let's get a little bit more supplemental guidance on this. Separation of duties addresses the potential for abuse of authorized privileges and helps to reduce the risk of malevolent activities without collusion. What does that mean? So think about it. You're in a large organization like Lockheed Martin. Lockheed Martin has a large contract with a health and human services. Now, I don't have any pre. I've never worked for Lockheed. I don't have any pre uh, any kind of special information on either one of these things. I'm about to say this is pure speculation uh, on my part. So if I accidentally guess right, it was an accident. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, Lockheed Martin, who I've never worked for, <laughs> has a large contract with health and human services. Right, they have a uh, thousand computers and ten thousand users. Right, so these ten thousand users, let's say, are managed on um, on a server and uh, on on several different act, uh, uh, active do, active directory uh, servers. Um, somebody, one of the administrators, is doing something they shouldn't do. They are making new users over and over again. Why do we have 10,000 users? Somebody is making new users. So in this case, you would want to have separation of duties so that this person who's abusing their power is monitored by a whole other organization. This is just one example of separation of duties, by the way. You could have a security operations team, and what their job is to do is to watch everything on the network. They're not only watching data going in and out of the network, but they're also watching users. Maybe they have a flag set up to whenever somebody creates a new user, 
They can see who created the user, what account made that user, when did they made that user, and then and maybe they even set up something like a justification, like a why. So every time you make a new user account, you have to make a justification and go through the SOC team. So that is one way that you can make it so that these people aren't abusing their power. And that's what they're, they're saying here. Separation of duties addresses the potential for abuse of authorized, uh, authorized privileges. Because somebody could give themselves more privilege. Or they can make 15 other accounts and then make all those accounts these secret backdoor user accounts that allow them in and in inside access there's just so many different things you can do if you don't have separation of duties in a large environment and that's really mainly what it's for so you want to do it when it's when it makes sense to do it all right so i think we beat that dead horse let's keep going here uh, and then what we'll do is i uh, will show you how you can document um separation of duties but for now let's talk about the next the next item, which is least privilege. Least privilege is this one right here, AC6, least privilege. Let's go into this one and talk about least privilege. Access control, least privilege. And if you're if you're if you don't have any context here, if you're you just jumped on this live and you're like, man, what's what is he talking about? What is NISC? Special Publication 853 Rev 4. What is that? What's going on? If you're interested in actually knowing more about this kind of this field, this path, uh, what I'm talking about is security compliance. Security compliance specifically with NIST. And I have a whole course if you're interested. It's called Risk Management Framework Information System Security Officer Foundations. And it talks about uh, it talks about how to do security compliance using the NIST standard. But then I have another one coming out real soon that talks about how to document everything I'm talking about to you. Now I give you context of how it all works. I I'll break down different documentation and I'm gonna go through all the families or most of the families. I don't know if I'm gonna cover all of them, but I'm gonna cover most of the families in that, um, in that course that's coming out soon. So go ahead and check that out on combocourses.com if you're interested. All right, let's keep going here. Least privilege. Now, this one right here, this one's near and dear to my heart. Um, this is something that many different organizations, um, I would say most, most of the organizations that I've ever worked for violate this one. The reason why is because we as human beings are lazy. We want to do the least amount of work for the greatest amount of impact. <laughs> so if there's a way that we can give somebody, if we have a really smart system administrator in our organization and we want that server fixed this guy who's really the smartest guy in the organization does cisco routers but we also want him we just start giving this person all of these different privileges that they don't need right that's one of the things that happens with least privilege another thing we'll do and or especially in large organizations is we will we'll have like say a thousand different users, right? And the users don't really need, they only need to access their workstation. But they keep coming up with these different things that happen. Like maybe they have this annoying pop-up and we've restricted their laptop to where they can only do their job. They can only, but they got this annoying pop-up. So every time they get this pop-up, they contact the help desk and they're like, hey, could you guys fix this pop-up? After a while, the help desk is like, okay, forget it. Let's just give these guys local admin privileges so that they can fix it themselves. And then they tell them how to fix it, right? But they, and then like, well, it's just local admin privileges. What could possibly go wrong with that? A lot can go wrong with that. <laughs> That's another violation of least privilege. What is least privilege? Let's talk about it. The organization employs a principle of least privilege, allowing only authorized access for users which are necessary to accomplish the assigned tasks in accordance with the organization's mission or business function what did i just say so what i'm saying is you only give people the privileges that they need to do their job period full stop that's it that's what pr least privilege is and th th like i said the reason why this is violated is because we're lazy we want to do the easiest thing possible and it's harder to give people limited privileges when Every time they need extra privileges, they have to go and ask. They got to play Mother May I to go get access to the logs or this pop up is keeps popping up. I want to stop it. You know, so 
least privileges, it's one of the biggest issues I've, that I've seen in organizations. Let's look at the supplemental guidance here. Organizations, uh, the organization employs least privilege for specific duties and information systems. The principle of least privilege is also applied to information system processes, ensuring that the processes operate at a privilege level no higher than necessary to accomplish the, uh, the required organizational or business mission or business function. You only give the privileges that are needed to do the job, period. So runaway privileges is one of the biggest issues in most organizations. I've In 90% of the organizations I've been to, this is the biggest violation and this is the one that gets the most people in trouble. Um, let's talk about how to document these two controls that we just talked about here. Uh, what I'm going to do is bring up I'm going to bring up a couple things. If you're doing risk management framework, documentation is the name of the game. We, the reason why we document so much, and I know I talked to some of my system administrators who are very technical. They're all, their head is always you know, deep, deep in the weeds on how to implement these systems or set up a new Linux server or whatever, right? So they don't have time for documentation a lot of times, or at least that's how they feel. But the reason why documentation is so important to somebody who does what I do, which is um, security compliance, is that if we don't have documentation, a lot of times we don't know who has privileges and who don't. We don't know what privileges are needed here or to this person or what role we even have. Sometimes organizations are so large that they don't even know what roles they have. And they don't even know what roles have what privileges. And the reason why is because they didn't document it. So you have to make sure that you document. And that's why it's, it's so important. One of the biggest reasons why we have to document is um, is having a security baseline. If you don't document, you don't know what baseline you have. And a lot of times, that's the reason why you have a legacy system out there on Windows uh, 2003 or Windows 2000 or something like that in the year 2020, you know, <laughs> and then there's no support for that system. And so it's out there and you didn't even know it was out there. So that's why you have to document, document, document. Let's talk about documentation here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up an example of how you would document these two controls. What this is here is a one example one format of a system security plan. This is a system security plan right here. And what we were just looking at is AC6. Here's AC6 right here. AC6. And how will we document this? So in a system security plan, normally you have an implementation statement. And so that's what we're going to put right here. And normally this thing will say, okay, did you tailor it in? What did you, is it, is it implemented or not? Is it tailored in or is it tailored out? Meaning, did you did you need it? Sometimes you don't need certain security controls. So you would say, if, if that was the case, we would say it's tailored out. But in this case, it's tailored in. We need it. What is the implementation status? It is implemented. And if you didn't have it, let's say we didn't we we know we need least privilege, but we don't have it, we would say planned. Now keep in mind, this is just one way to document into a security plan. Uh, there's also, here's, a, let me just show you real quick another way that you can document. You can document it like this if you wanted to. This is a Word document. And this Word document is a template. I've seen organizations do it like this before. Um, a little uh, easier to, on the eyes, I think. Easier on the eyes, but harder to deal with when you have large amounts of data than a spreadsheet. Spreadsheets, in my opinion, are easier. But there's another level that's above this that most organizations, large organizations, are going to, which is like a database. You put that stuff in a database, and the re it's way easier to deal with in a database. Because the more data that you have on these spreadsheets, the, the more confusing it gets, the more you lose track of things. All right, so what kind of control is it? It's a common control, inherited, which is something we talk about in the course. And then here's where we, the implementation statement comes in. So we would say something like this, least, uh, let's say our organization is um, 
Lockheed General. General. I'm just making stuff up. <laughs> um, adheres to the principle of least privilege by enforcing a global policy GPO so that it's a technical way that they are enforcing all privileges throughout the whole environment you're just saying what what the organization is doing this is how you document you're not making this stuff up all right let me just be very clear about this in the real world what you okay my head is covering this up let me just move myself out of the way here before I that's what I typed right there so let me just be very clear you're not making this stuff up as an information system security officer as a security compliance person whether you work for the bank or the government or hospital you're not making any of this stuff up you're gathering the information from from the organization so you that means you have to bring in stakeholders that's the people who do this stuff on a regular basis that means it might even mean your CIO it might mean your CFO it might mean your your the actual people implementing it the system administrators or maybe you're the system administrator or maybe it's already written in there another policy somewhere else you would grab that information and then you're gonna put it into this system security plan all of our system security documents are focused on security like you might have HR has their own documents uh, the architect guys have their own documents the the technical team have their wikis and their work instructions and their all that stuff we're focused on the security features of this system and so that's what we're doing we're gathering from all these other existing documents where we can and we're interp we're putting those into pouring those into our system security plan now another place that's really good let me move my face here another place is really really good to document to document these security features is a security policy a security policy is really good because you can really break down you can really break down each individual each individual item with a security policy I've got AC4 AC5 AC11 and many other things so in the security policy I can really focus in and say here's what we have here and and be very very specific and you're not making this stuff up you're getting it from the actual people who know the system so that's what you have to do as a system security person and that's AC uh, the AC controls in a nutshell and like I said if you're interested in this you can go check out combo courses if you want to deep dive into this kind of stuff and now I'm gonna open up to any kind of questions that anybody has um, to let you know what's going on any questions whatsoever about anything we talked about is a great opportunity to talk about it. I see a few people here that's joined me. Um, uh, cybersecurity guy, how do you ever defeat your rival hacker? Um, so I think that it's there's that's not how that's not how I would um, format. That's not how I see it. That's not my perspective on how what's going on here. So what's going on is you're controlling your data as best your pos as possible in your organization. It's not you're not defeating an individual person. This is just how I see it. This is not personal. So the way I see it is I am working for my organization to protect their information. I'm working for uh, their interest. So whatever their interest is, like I, that's what I'm protecting, and it's a team effort. It's not me against some random hacker out there. And the, you know, from the hacker's perspective, from the malicious criminal hacker's perspective, because some hackers are good. From a malicious attacker's perspective, it's not personal. They just they have a mission too, and it's either money or it's, it's activism, or and they're not usually just going after one organization. They're going after many organizations. Um, and seeing what works and me as a as a cybersecurity guy same thing I'm just working for the interest of my organization and it's a team effort I'm working with several other people who 
this guy does firewalls. This guy does vulnerability management. This other person is the CEO of the company. They they have to manage uh, all of the resources of the company. Uh, they have a fiduciary responsibility for the organization's uh, information. So there's many different people working on this. It's not me against one lone hacker. And then from the hacker's perspective, from the attacker's perspective, it's nothing personal. They just want to find the weakest link. And they're just... Usually what they'll do is they'll search the whole, you know, a whole spectrum of the internet to look for the weakest link or to look for free information that's being given out there that they can use that information to infiltrate the weakest person who's out there. So that's it, guys. Um, if there's no other questions, I'm going to go ahead and go. Oh, wait, I got somebody here. Let me see. They said, um, I need a job and I don't have any information system security background coming from a Linux system engineering background what will be the best advice what would be your advice please help me uh, this is this is easy if you have a Linux background um, you don't so right now even with the virus even with all the stuff's happening even with the lockdown now it has slowed down. Like I, some of the employers that have, have talked to me said, that there's right now there's a free hiring freeze going on throughout. Um, there's a hiring freeze going on, right? For obvious reasons, right? You can't do interviews in person. You can't. You don't know what. We don't know how long this is going to last. We don't know. For large organizations, they don't know what kind of um, what their fiscal year is going to look like if they, they're losing sales, depends on what kind of industry they're in, but there's just a lot of uncertainty right now. Right? So obviously the markets have slowed down a lot. So, but that being said, people do still need information system security officers. So if I were you, here's what I would do. If I were you, Here's one of the things that, and I have a whole series about this, by the way. I would go to Indeed.com. I've got a. If you're interested in this, I got an entire series that talks about. I got a whole series that talks about how to market yourself, and that's what it's all about: marketing yourself. I would go to Indeed.com. Here's one of the places I would go to, Mr. Bun Me Golden. And then I would type in, I don't know what your skill set is, but you said Linux. Linux is pretty hot. What kind of Linux is it? Red Hat? You got to be specific. Let's say Red Hat. I'm, I'm going to assume you're, you're a Red Hat Linux guy. Red Hat. I'm going to assume you're a Red Hat administrator. All right. And where? What? Where are you, where are you at? Let's say you are, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume you're in Texas, Houston, Texas. Your Red Hat administrator. I have to, I'd have to know more about like what you have going on to to actually help you out in a more realistic way. But uh, I'm assuming you're a Red Hat administrator and that you have about five years of experience and you are in Houston, Texas. And I'm gonna go find jobs. Now I'm I'm kind of assuming you're in in the U.S. So now look at this. D.C. And you're looking for a job? Come on, man. Come on, man. This always blows my mind. D.C. is one of the hottest areas for IT. D.C., Virginia, that whole area is hot, hot, hot. Like, I... I there's not almost... There's barely a week that goes by that somebody from, um, from uh, Washington, D.C. is not trying to contact me about a job. The thing is, most of us IT guys... And, you know, it's not your fault... Your profession is a, is technical, right? You, we're not marketers. Thing is, you want to market your resume. You want to market yourself. That's the key. That's the whole key to this whole thing. If you're interested in this, you have somebody else having to be watching this kind of thing. I got a. You go to combocourses.com. You can go check out my course. It talks about how to how I've been able to have not only a job, but a six figure job working from home for the last X years. And I'm not I'm not some freaking genius, man. I'm not some freaking prodigy. I'm not some freaking genius. The only thing that se separates me from other people is that I work really hard. That's it. You know, I mean, I, I know, having seen extremely brilliant people, I know I'm not one of those guys. <laughs> I know I'm not one of those guys. You know, everything I do, I have to work my ass off for, right? So 
that said, you know, I, I have a, a level of success that allows me to take care of my family, my wife and kids, and, and um, travel the world and do what I want, you know, um, if when I want, how I want. But anyway, okay, back to your question. You said, how do I find a job? You're, I'm assuming you're a red, okay, so you said red hat six and seven in Washington, D.C. All right, so let's, let's look at this. I would go to Indeed.com. I would make, I would upload my resume. See this? It says upload your resume. If you're following along, if you're, if you're really hungry, man, you could, right now, I'm going to show you how to do it. Upload your resume. Fill this out. Don't just upload it. Fill out the complete profile. If you look at my course, my course walks you through everything. What kind of keywords to use, how to find the right keywords, all that kind of stuff. If you're not interested in that, you want to get it for free, I'll show you right now. Upload your resume. Fill out the entire profile, all right? Put in all, every one of your skills in there. Don't even leave one out. Because there's a place where it allows you to put your skills in, how to it allows you to put in all every place you've ever worked. How many years of experience do you have? If you don't mind me asking. Okay, so Red Hat Administrator. Now look at this. Now let me show you something else. So if you look at this, it'll tell you who's hiring like right now. And these two places, one in Virginia, one in DC, are hiring right now. Right now. It means they have an urgent hiring. They really need somebody who knows this stuff. Right, so here's SIC. SIC is a good company, by the way. Um, at least when I was doing it many years ago. They got you got medical industry. You've got Linux. There's a couple of industries that lend themselves. Oh, four years, man, that's perfect. So there's a couple industries that really lend themselves to you working almost anywhere in almost any industry. And one of those is Linux. It's super hot. It somebody always need it needs it because. They just don't, we just don't have enough people who know it. Now, so what I did was I clicked on this top one right here. And let's just break this thing apart. Let's look at this. So these guys will tell you what they need from you. If you don't fit this, then move on to the next thing. The magic of putting your resume into Indeed.com, putting it, uploading it, and putting all your skills is that after a while, Indeed, now it's not the best algorithm. I'm going to show you a better one in a, in a second. But it's but the thing about it is once you put your stuff in there, it will match up different jobs that fit your resume. So right here, as we're looking, we're being very active. And we're looking at this this job here. It's, they, they require a bachelor's degree. Do you have a bachelor's degree? If you have a bachelor's degree, guess what? This That's great. Good for you. Demonstrate experience with system engineering to include network design, documentation, installation. Now, like I said, if you don't fit this, go on to the next job. If you do, apply, apply now. If you put your resume in there, when you hit apply now, it will take your resume and it sends it to them. Let me show you what, let's keep going here. All right, this one is Exologic Administrator, remote. This is a remote position right here. Look at this. You just go through what requirements, what re skill requirements, and now they want Oracle. I don't know if you you know Oracle, but if you don't know Oracle, move on to the next one. We want Linux administrator. We want Red Hat administrator. SAIC. Now here's SAIC's uh, one of their job pages here. Pretty good company. And um, let me see here. Yeah, see, look at this happiness score. I never seen that before. <laughs> I think I clicked the wrong thing here. We wanted, I wanted to actually see the job, so let's just go to the job itself of uh, SAIC. Okay, it's talking about a little, little bit about SAIC, and we're looking at the job description. This is what you do if you're really hungry for a job. You go through every single one of these, every single one, and you find a match for you. But if you put your resume in. It does half the work for you because the algorithm is going to match you up with certain jobs. But you don't want to just wait for that. You want to put that in there, let it do this work, and then you want to be extremely active and look at every one of these. And look at which ones. Look at the duties. If you can do it, apply for it. If it's a really long drive, you know, factor that into your final decision. 
you want to probably find something closer to you, but don't rule it out, right? Don't like I'm the type of person if I need to feed my family, I'll work at freaking McDonald's, man. I'll I'll work the fries and then at night I'll moonlight and deliver pizzas. Like do what you got to do to take care of yourself and your family. You know what I mean? So let's go to the next one, system administrator. But you don't have to do that. You're a Linux administrator. You don't have to you don't have to flip burgers. You don't have to, you know, yeah, Linux administrator is no joke. And you have four years of experience, you should you should have a, a really good job right now. And I'm gonna show you how to get one. All right, so bottom line, go through every one of these. Upload your resume. Upload your resume. And then you can type in your location, your skill set right here. You can search them, but the big thing is to upload your resume. Now let me show you something else. LinkedIn. If you're in the U.S., LinkedIn is one of the best sites to find jobs. I'm going to show you a better one after this, a better one than LinkedIn, in my personal opinion. Uh, a couple better ones. For LinkedIn, now in my course, I'll tell you exactly how I'm able to get so many job opportunities from LinkedIn. This, I don't have a lot of people who actively follow me here, but I can tell you most of the people who contact me, these are real opportunities um, for me. So what I did was what you, what you're going to do, uh, is you're going to fill out, you're going to sign up on LinkedIn and you're going to fill completely fill out this profile, completely fill it out. And the more you fill it out, the more targeted that it will be, uh, the more targeted the traffic you're going to get, the more targeted, the people who contact you, there are technical recruiters that contact you, uh, the more targeted they'll be towards you, and that that way, more people, the most most of the people who contact you will be legitimate um, jobs for you. Fill it out. But here's another thing you can do: Red Hat Linux Administrator. Look at this. You can join groups, right? Join groups. Here's another thing you can do. So you're going to join groups, you're going to make a complete profile. I hope you're taking notes. And then you're going to admin. We're going to look for jobs. We just typed in Red Hat Linux admin. And these are all the other people who are also admins. Now, look at this. I want you to take note of this. This guy came up number two. This means technical recruiters are literally typing this in. Red Hat Linux administrator. And they're seeing this guy's face. Why is this guy number one? Think about it. Why is this guy number one? Why is he coming up? Why is everybody seeing this guy's face? Why is he getting so many job opportunities? He filled out his complete profile. That's why. He filled this entire profile out. That's why he's getting so many jobs. That's what you have to do. Now, if I go to this next, now I'm actually looking for jobs here. So let's just keep scrolling. Now, note how this is broken, broke down. So see, it has, it starts off with other people. Then it talks about the jobs. And then groups should be here somewhere. I'm looking. Yeah, here's here's different. Oh, these are different companies. You can follow the companies. You follow them. Every time they come out with a new, something new, it'll pop up in your messages or notifications. But what I'm looking for is jobs. I'm going to say see all if you're following along. And once again, what we're going to do is we're going to go through every one of these. Even though this says cough. Kafka engineer analyst. I'm going to go see what this is. I don't know what this is. It says promoted. I usually avoid the promoted ones because they're paying for it, but that's fine. Even check those ones out too. It's telling you where, what location. Oh, look, we didn't put our location in. Let's make sure we put our location. Uh, you said Washington, D.C., Baltimore. Look at this. Washington, Baltimore, one of the hottest places for jobs, by the way. And they pay a great amount of money, especially if you're willing to travel. Um, okay, so this one is, I don't know if you know Splunk, but Splunk developer, okay, so that's not what we want. Let's keep going. We want some more like Linux kind of administrator type work. This one's looking for SEI clearance. I'm, I'm assuming that you don't know, as you don't have that. That's a clearance. Uh, not, not a lot of people have, I don't have a TS SEI, I don't think anymore. Uh, that's Splunk. Let's skip that one. Let's go to the next one. So if, if, if it's obvious you don't know that, you know, just move on to the next one. But this one right here, this one deserves our, our time. Let's look at this one. What are they looking for? 
Now notice I'm just, I'll come back to this later. They're talking about what kind of business it is, it's women owned and all this kind of stuff. I'll come back to that. Right now, what I'm looking for is what is in the job description? Can I do it? Nope, look at this, it says security, uh, this TSSCI clearance. I don't have a clearance, so let's keep let's keep it moving. Notice how I'm just going through these. Like, if I don't, if if there's any indication I can't do the job, I move on. And the reason why is because I got stuff to do. You know, I I need to find people who are a good fit for me. That's what we're doing. We're trying to find what's the best fit for a Linux Red Hat administrator in Washington, Baltimore. Is this even in the same right location, Virginia? Okay, I could drive there. Um, Security plus requirements. Do you have a security plus? Do you have any kind of uh, security clearances? Okay, I'm assuming not. And this is asking for Oracle stuff. So no, I'm going to move on. This is this is how you do it right here. Now, my it looks like my search is not great. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change my keywords here. I'm going to go to, I'm going to call this Red Hat Linux Administrator. Administrator. Look at this man. I can barely spell. You're a Linux administrator. I'm a I'm a American with one language who can barely spell. And if I can get a job, you can get a job. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. All right. Okay. Look at this. Red Reston, Virginia. Okay. That's not too far from Washington. You're willing to make the drive, but security clearance. So we can't do that one. Let's keep going here. Security clearance, security clearance. Raytheon. Raytheon is a is an okay company. Uh, they get a lot of contracts, so you'll you'll see tons of jobs from these guys. Must be a U.S. citizen and SEI clearance. Okay, moving on. Now I'm assuming that in the East Coast, this is one of the problems you have is looking for jobs with that don't require clearance. Um, so I'm moving on to General Dynamics, another very large company it has. 10,000 employees. Let's see here. Okay, here we go. Scope of work. They explain to you what you what they're expecting from you. Um, looking for requirements. Education. No degree. 10 years of tripwire experience. Okay, if you don't have tripwire experience, then let's move on. So you need to go through every one of these. After you make your profile, first thing you want to do Go to Indeed.com, put in your profile. Go to LinkedIn.com, make a profile. Once you make the profile, it starts to find jobs that fit you. The reason why this is coming up with stuff that fits me is because I have my, pro I have my, I already have a very full uh, profile there. So it's automatically searching things that fit me. So it's kind of, um, I'm having a hard time finding stuff that fits you. That's why it's very imperative that you do this. Um, okay. Let's look at these skills right here. They're saying in-depth knowledge of HBSS. Okay, let's, I'm assuming you don't know that. Let's just keep going. Red Hat Platform and Applications Administrator. So I'm assuming this one's like a, a software engineer somewhat. Qualifications. This one might fit you. Obtain a public, a public trust clearance. Okay, so this one might fit you because they're not looking for a, a SCI clearance, which not everybody can get or has. But public trust clearances just means that they'll do a background check on you and you don't have to be a U.S. citizen. You could be a green car holder um, or whatever, but public trust is, is easier to get. Five years experience with Red Hat. You said four. You could still pull it off. I would still apply for it. I'd apply. This one, this one might be good for you, actually. I would look at this one right here. Look at this. Cold, this is some stuff you can learn. Cold Fusion. Well, they're saying three to five years of web sphere experience. If you have that, I'd apply for this one. We're getting closer. All right, let's keep going. Let's go keep going down here. You get the idea. You're going to go through every one of these and try to find a match. All right? Try to find a match for you. If it doesn't, if it in anything's out of place, the closer you get to a match, you want to apply for those jobs, right? The closer you get to a match, the better because those are going to be give you the most probability of actually getting an interview with them. Now, let me show you a couple of other places that are really good to apply for. Um, there's Dice.com, which is probably the best technical place to find a job in the United States of America. So 
what you would do is go to dice.com and then type in Red Hat Linux. You know, let's change it up. Let's type in Linux Administrator. There we go right there. See this? Look at, take note of this. Look at this. See how this keyword popped up? That means this is highly searched and they have tons of jobs for this. But then they also have other job titles here too. Linux Administration, Linux Administrator, Senior Linux Administrator, and SR Senior Administrator. There's many different ones. What you wanna do is click one of the ones that fit closest to you. Let's look at another keyword, Red Hat. Let's see what pops up with Red Hat. Look at this. See all these keywords? These are the keywords you wanna use. All these keywords right here. These ones that people are typing in. These people that have hot jobs that you're that you're looking for. But I wanna go back to Linux. Administrator. I mean, this is the one right here. And then we, we gotta type in a location. You said Washington. Washington, D.C. Boom, find jobs. So y'all notice all these jobs. Look at it. Look how technical all these technical jobs. Look how this one's way better than Indeed and way better than uh, LinkedIn as far as search options go for technical people. What another thing you want to do is don't look for anything too old. Um, if it's months old, then just forget it. This one's one hour. This one's nine days. This one's twelve hours. Twelve hours. Ten hours. Two hours. These are just recently posted. Some of these. Right. I said there was a hiring freeze, but look at this. One hour, 16 days ago, 30 days ago. I would avoid these ones. That's kind of a long time. If it's after 30 days, I would I would not apply for that. Um, but you never know. You know, never know. This one, uh, 11 hours ago, one day ago, one hour ago. Rest in VA, two days ago. That's not too far from where you live. Uh, Linux uh, engineer. Linux admin experience. You get the idea, but what you want to do is make yourself a full-blown profile that looks something like this. Now I'm going to show you one last site to go check out. I've completely filled out 100% of my uh, of my information on here, and that's what you have to do too. I put all my skills. I put all the skill keywords, and so I'm constantly getting. If if this was turned on. I'd get a flood of jobs from this from these guys, from people on dice.com looking for people like yourself and like me. Okay, I'm gonna go to monster.com. This is the last one I'm gonna show you. Monster.com, the first thing you need to do is upload your resume. Upload your resume. Put all your keywords in, all that kind of stuff. And then once you're done with that, you'll do this. Linux, you are you noticing a pattern here? Linux administrator, look at this. It already tells me what the keywords to look for L linux systems administrator another great keyword boom but we want to change this location we want to say washington D it's our it's already requesting what places to go i'm gonna search monster.com probably most of the jobs i get come from monster.com i don't know why that is but i've gotten a lot of jobs from here even though dice i would say is probably the best technical place that I've gone to, Linked, uh, LinkedIn has the best interpersonal connections. Like I know the most people from there. And then uh, Indeed.com is a really good search engine, really good, but it's an aggregator. It grabs stuff from all over the internet and then uh, it will have them all there for you. But the best one is, the one I've gotten the most effects from is Monster.com. So what you wanna do is make a profile here and then you want to do the same thing. See all these jobs? Jobs, jobs, jobs. I'm always blown away when IT guys contact me and say they can't find a job. Blows my mind. And then I just, it's like I don't get it, man. I, I mean, not only am I, do I have a job, but people compete for me to work for them. Not only that, but, you know, when they compete for you, you can name, you can, you let's say you come in at 60000 and then somebody else will offer you seventy thousand, and then somebody else will offer you eighty thousand. It's crazy. There's just not enough of us technical people. There's not enough of us system security people. There's not enough 
Linux administrators. There's not enough database people. There's not enough with us to have the skills to do this work, and that's why we're in high demand right now. It's not going to last forever. You know, it, at some point, people are going to get wise, and they're going to start jumping in on the bandwagon. Um, even though the economy, like, is going to suffer for probably the next two years, honestly, after this coronavirus, like, it's probably going to suffer for the next two years. We're probably headed into a recession. They still need IT guys. And you happen to be in a career field that is in, not only is it in high demand, but there's not many people who are going to be able to compete with you because not many people know Linux. We just have a very narrow path right now, but it's not going to always be like that. Eventually, it's going to be completely saturated. We're not going to be able to make as much money. There's going to be too many people to compete with, and we're going to have to have some other specialization, you know. But that's it, guys. I'm going to go ahead and stop this. I hope this was, um, I hope this was as beneficial for you as it has been for me. Um, on that note, please take care of yourself. Use social distancing and all the stuff that they're that the CDC and the WHO are telling us to do as far as trying to get these numbers of coronavirus cases down. Uh, take care of yourself. Um, wash your hands. <laughs> Don't touch your face because that's how you infect yourself if you're out and about and getting stuff. And and um, that's it, guys. We'll talk to you later.